Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the amazing gospel that you've given to us, the message of salvation in Christ. And um, Lord, help us to, to live our lives such that uh, those who, who see it say, what's up with that? Why, why do you have such hope? Uh, why do you have uh, such joy? Um, where is that coming from? And uh, so we and give us the courage then to answer that question. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was at a training session yesterday. Well, I, I guess I couldn't really call it a training session. Uh, the, the Treehouse organization is rebranding. And normally I think of that and, and go, okay, so you got a new logo. Woohoo, you know. Um, but one of the things that, that they're doing, they're changing a lot of their um, language to, that I think really clarifies some of the, their message uh, in a really positive way, uh, in a way that where I've kind of struggled with some of their old stuff, and then they, it's like they fixed it. And I went, oh, go, oh, thank you. I, I, like I stopped them in the, <laughs> in the middle of the presentation. I mean, I didn't stop them. They said any questions. I said, all right, so I just got to thank you for, for fixing this. And um, because there was a lot of, I mean, was, a lot of the, the stuff was kind of um, long and, and drawn out and, um, and, and stuff. And, and, you know, people would say, what's well, Treehouse? And, and I'd go, how much time do you got? You know, and, um, and so now they have uh, some simpler things. Uh, they, they've got a, a very simple mission statement that goes something like this. Um, our mission is to end hopelessness in every team. And I went, yeah, yeah, that, that so beautifully describes yeah. what this program is all about, what this organization is all about. And, um, and, and I said, and, and this really nicely fits into uh, the way we uh, do things too. I like to say that um, you know, people ask me what I do or, or things like that, and I say I'm a purveyor of hope. Um, you know, I, I pedal in hope, and um, you know that's that's what I do, and um, and so you know that I, I see is is that's what we're you know striving ultimately to do is is to give hope uh, to a world without hope. So then the question is, how do we do that? And we we got into some of the nuts and bolts last month, um, and uh, so then uh, this this video just uh, came out not too long ago. It's a a report on a um, on a survey, and I want to show it to you uh, because I think it's really helpful in, in directing the rest of our conversation. Well, hey there, and welcome to Pro Church Tools, the show where in 10 minutes or less, you're going to get a dose of tips and tactics to help your church share the message of Jesus. But we navigate the biggest communication shift we've seen in 500 years. I'm your host, Alex Mills, joined as always by the boss man, Brady Shearer. Barna has just published a new book called Reviving Evangelism, mm -hmm. Alex, and one of the sections within that book talks about the way Christians are approaching conversations with people that are without faith in Christ. Okay. And when it comes to the top three qualities, non-Christians and lapsed Christians, meaning those that were once connected to Christianity and are no longer, when it comes to what they want from faith conversation, the Sparta went directly to the source. Let's not talk to Christians for right. a sec. Let's talk to the people that Christians want yeah. to talk to. Yeah, what do you want out of these kinds of conversations? Exactly. The top three Responses. Number one, listening without judgment. 62% of lapsed Christians and non-Christians said that's what they want in a partner when they're talking mm -hmm. about faith, but only 34% of Christians they know personally exhibit that trait. Wow. Number two, do not force conclusions. 50% of non-Christians and lapsed Christians wanted that. So they're talking sure. to somebody, but only 26% of Christians they know display that trait. And then number three, Allowing others to draw their own conclusions, 43% said, that's what we want, and only 22% of Christians they know personally display those traits. Mm -hmm. So quickly, number one, listening without judgment. Yep. Number two, not forcing conclusions. And number three, allowing others to draw their own conclusions, which is basically the same as number two, <laughs> but to get separated into a separate category. Yeah. When it comes to Christians, what do we value in these conversations? What do we think is most important when sharing our faith? Not what non-Christians <laughs> want, shockingly. What we think is most important is confidence when we share our own faith, mm -hmm. exhibiting a vibrant faith. 
right? We want to live out loud to yeah. quote the great Hawk Nelson. Mm -hmm. And then finally, wait, that was love out loud. I can't remember. Hawk Nelson's a long time ago. Yeah. And then finally, helping others have a spiritual experience for themselves. So we've got two different parties mm -hmm. wanting to talk about faith with one another. Not Christians, last Christians actually willing to talk about sure. faith. Yeah. They're not like closed off. But our two different parties have completely different approaches yeah. and wants and strategies for doing it. What's interesting, in the qualities that matter most to lapsed Christians and non-Christians, that being, hey, it's okay to listen without judgment, Christians agree. 76% are like, yeah, we should do that. But only 44% say, I do that. <laughs> right, right. So it's like, <laughs> Christians are like, I understand where they're coming from. Yes, I don't do that very yeah. well. I mean, but isn't that the problem, though, whether it's a conversation about faith or anything else that you're extremely opinionated about, it is a challenge to have those conversations and remove any preconceived judgments or notions that you have and, and remove you know, uh, the, the, the pressure to have the other person end the conversation by agreeing with you, right? That's like forcing that conclusion. And so it honestly, whether it's something that we care about that has nothing to do with faith, or these existential matters of life and death that are all encompassed in our faith, we care a lot about this. And so we bring a lot of that to the table, and so it really is hard to get rid of that judgment. I'm talking personally in my own life, to remove judgment from those conversations and try not to have some sort of like unspoken agenda in mm -hmm. those conversations, that's hard. And so no wonder Christians say, yeah, I would love to have a conversation like this, but honestly, if I'm self-reflecting myself, I'm not sure I'm well-equipped enough to do it well. And that's what the Barna takeaway is. If you quote the end of this article, it says, However willing they may be, Christians' ability to witness for Christ may be impeded by the simple fact that they don't have meaningful relational connections with non-Christians on the or the conversational skills necessary to talk meaningfully about faith. You brought up a good point. The need to be right. You always talk about being unoffendable. I try. And this is a discipline that you are teaching me in, because sometimes we have differing opinions, mm -hmm. and for whatever reason, I feel the need, not in one conversation, but over multiple days and weeks, yeah. to keep returning to being like, no, but what you don't get, and why you're wrong, yeah. it's like I have this need, like Alex, as a reasonable individual, a one on the Enneagram, someone that wants to approach yeah. life with critical thinking, if he thinks differently than me, then what is this about? Yeah. Yeah. And I need to learn, and I keep trying to tell myself as I walk away from conversations, you're like, yeah, I don't agree. I'm like, it's okay. He doesn't agree. Yeah. Life isn't crumbling. When I, when my wife and I were engaged, an aunt on her side gave us this really meaningful gift. She gave us each six envelopes. Okay. And for each of the six months preceding our wedding, we had to open this envelope, and she she wrote these um these great letters and issued us both an individual kind of challenge, and or or something to do for the other person just to prepare us for marriage. And one of the months, and this has marked my life forever. One of the months, she wrote to me and she said. For this month, don't tell Rebecca you're doing this. And unless you feel like you need to, don't ever tell her. Surrender the need to be right. And for me, that was really, really hard. And I started doing it silently, and Rebecca started noticing a difference. Like our, our, our heated conversations, our arguments, either they were less or they went differently. They took a different route and ended better. And that season, that month has taught me so much about having conversations with anyone, not just my wife, and especially these faith conversations, just surrendering the need to be right. Mm -hmm. Whether I think I am or not, and especially in these matters of life and death and faith, um, you know, we think that we do have something to offer somebody, but go into those conversations surrendering the need to be right, and, and don't have this goal by the end of the conversation of completing any sort of transaction, right? Get, don't go into that conversation hoping that at the end, somebody's going to say, a prayer and yeah, check them off. Like I won that person today mm. because non-believers or lapsed Christians, what you know, whatever title you want to give them, they can pick up on that, and that's not what right. they want. The BS just, meter is strong. yeah. They just want a conversation with somebody who's not going to pass judgment and is not going to force them into any sort of conclusion. Another big thing about judging a non-Christian or lapsed Christian is recognizing that you are not measuring the way that they are measured. Right. To go into a conversation where you're judging a non-Christian on beliefs that they don't hold to. Yeah, you're judging them on on your scale, not theirs. It just wouldn't make any sense no. at all. There are beliefs that you hold, values that you hold. They don't hold those values and beliefs. It, it doesn't make any sense to judge them based on a measuring stick that either they're unaware of or that they don't accept in their own lives. Anyway, another thing is to go into these conversations 
by letting go of dogmatic certainty. <laughs> you know, Pete Ennis describes it as the sin of certainty. Yeah. And this is something that I've experienced a lot growing up in, in fundamentalist faith. Like, here is your faith box. Everything fits nicely within it. If you stray beyond the faith box, you stray beyond the group. And right. you will be exiled and excommunicated. And again, when you're having conversations, lapsed Christians, non-Christians, they can pick up on this. Oh, they're seeing yeah, me as sure. an other. Mm -hmm. They're not inviting me and seeing me as an equal, right. a peer, a friend, a family member. They're just seeing me as a checkbox to be checked. Problem to be fixed. Exactly. And so surrendering that is also important. And that may require some, some theological deconstruction or some theological inspection. Like, okay, if someone doesn't agree with this, does that mean I have to? Because there are some things, some beliefs, that we just have to say that these are fundamental right. to the yeah. faith. The problem is, is that we've extended it to the most minute and insignificant issues, and we've made mountains out of molehills. That's why we have thousands of denominations. Majored on the minors. Yeah. And so you have to go into these conversations you know, with as open of a palm as you possibly mm -hmm. can. Unfortunately, we often go in with a closed fist. Well, and that's the thing. Because of the attitude that we approach these conversations with as Christians, these conversations, if and when we actually do have the opportunity to have them, are often over before they've even begun. When you go into the next conversation, you may have with a friend or family member, someone who's a non-Christian or a lapsed Christian. Remember the three things they care about most if you have a faith conversation. Number one, they want you to listen without judgment. Number two, don't force a conclusion. Don't feel like you need to walk away and have some type of transaction occur, mm -hmm. have some type of agreement, just let the conversation happen organically. Whatever it resolves or does not resolve, that's okay. And then number three, allow others to draw their own conclusions. Now I'm preaching to myself. We have a conversation. Alex feels <laughs> one thing and I feel another. Right. I'm allowed to make my own conclusions. I feel liberated in this. Thank you. What's funny about your story about your wife is that I do that with Brittany. I allow her to be right all the time. <laughs> But I can't with you. I won't allow it. No, we need yeah. to agree. Yeah. We're too similar. Today it changes. Because if you don't agree, what does that have to, what does that say about me? <laughs> Clearly I'm broken. Anyway, Alex and I are going to therapy. Yeah, and when you have your yeah. talks with non-Christians and lapsed Christians, consider these qualities. That'll do it for this episode of Pro Church Tools and the company. We'll see you next time. All right. Are these incredibly difficult? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate that they used the, um, the spouse analogy. Um, because I always, when I'm talking to, um, <clears throat> to, to couples that are getting ready to be married and stuff like that, I always emphasize, or for that matter, couples that are married and are struggling, right? Um, so often it's the same thing as this need to be right, right? Where we value the need to be right more than we value the relationship, right? And, um, and this causes so many problems in our lives. And, and I know that, that it's, this is a physician heal thyself kind of thing. This is something I really struggle with. If you ask my wife, well, she's very kind and she probably wouldn't admit it to you, but, um, but I, inside she'd be going, yeah, <laughs> all right? <laughs> um, but, you know, and so, especially when we talk about, you know, like, well, this is, this is everything though, you know, like you need to know this. And so, um, so, you know, listening without judgment, it's so easy to, whether it's a conversation about, you know, faith matters or, or anything, we have a tendency to listen and then like, we'll hear something we sort of latch onto and we form our response, and then we just sort of keep that response in mind and wait for them to finish talking. <laughs> haven't heard, not only haven't heard the rest of what they're saying, really, I haven't really thought about it, once we've sort of hit that spot, all right? But also, um, there's always that, what's the question behind the question, all right? Where are they coming from? Not, it's because it's not so much what is their conclusion and where, where are they at, but where are they coming from, right? And if you immediately come up with your judgment of, of, of where they're at, then you're not considering where they're coming from and therefore you really have no idea where they're at. 
and you're not gonna be able to connect with them if you don't know where they're coming from, right? And so, so th this comes back to the whole idea of meeting people where they're at, right? Understand, just understanding, asking a lot of questions, and saying, how did you get to this point? You know, what, where, where explain to me, um, and because you can say, okay, I see things differently, but obviously you didn't just come to this conclusion, um, you know, out of the blue. There's, you, you, you arrived at this. Explain to me how you arrived at that. Right, you know, people will be happy to tell you that. And, um, and, and so if, if you ask them, what is your journey that got you there, right? Then you are showing them that you care about them. You're investing in their relationship. And, and they, they, you know, they mentioned this in the video, but um, I'll elaborate on it. This is a long game thing. You know, you can't just enter into a conversation and, and expect that by the end of the conversation, it's like, okay, we're there, check them off, you know? And, and so, um, so we want to, to make a point of, of investing in the relationship, all right? I, I care about you whether you ever come to, um, to faith or not because I love you, because Jesus loves you, and you are not a merit badge. Right. My salvation is not dependent on you reaching a, a certain point spiritually in your life. Right. I am already saved. God already loves me, and so I'm going to love you. Because I can do that, because I've got nothing to lose. All right. And so, so that brings us to not forcing a conclusion. All right. And I, I say this... Uh, over and over with, with teaching and, and things like that. Teach people how to think, not what to think. Right? Talk about, you know, where you're coming from, but, but also, um, you know, think about, think about for yourself. How did I arrive? What's my spiritual journey that got me to this point? And how did I end up not some other direction. Is it just because that's what my parents said and so I've just gone along with that? Most people at some point in their lives, they've sort of stopped and asked that question. All right, well, how did you come to this conclusion? All right, and, um, and recognize that not everybody's walked the same path and therefore they're not gonna arrive at the same conclusion. And, um, and recognize that the value of the relationship is in the relationship, not the conclusion. And, um, and so allow others to draw their own conclusions. And, all right, and even if you are in, just inside screaming, no, that is wrong, <laughs> all right? Mm -hmm. If they started at point A and ended up at point B and can show you the path, how they got there, all right? It may be that, that we look at it and go, yeah, but that's not right. But logically, it is a valid conclusion. And not just logically, oftentimes this, is, this doesn't come down to logic, it comes down to emotion. All right? And, and like Pastor Albrecht often says, you can't uh, reason someone uh, out of a position that they didn't reason themselves into. And, um, and that's brilliant. Right. So... I saw this bumper sticker and just kind of made me sick. <laughs> if Jesus had a gun, he'd still be alive today. <laughs> like, okay, how many ways could it possibly, can one statement possibly be wrong? <laughs> you know, I mean, because you, you think, look at it and go, wait, wait, wait. No, they actually had a sword and told them to put it away. I mean, they had the, the, the means to defend themselves and, and, and he said no, and he actually undid the damage, and and um, and he is alive today. <laughs> you know, so, but this I was actually just um, talking to somebody uh, about this today after I listened to a, a sermon of a friend of mine, and 
and afterward I sent him a note about it because um, it was like he he nailed it and um, and I, and I wanted and it hit something that I've been thinking about a lot lately and it's the two kingdoms are the same kingdom of God, all right? So we talk about the, the what we, uh, Lutherans call two kingdoms theology, all right? The kingdom of the left, the the law, the um, the government, right? And the kingdom of the right, the church, grace, okay? And um, and and you run into problems when you mix the two, all right? Which is uh, more commonly known as separation of church and state, all right? That if you if you try to combine them and have the church do the government's job, you run into problems. If you have the government try to do the church's job, you run into problems, okay? And yet, at the same time, it's the same kingdom of God, All right? It's just, it's different aspects. It's, it's just, you have, it's all the same kingdom, but you have different people with different jobs doing different things, all right? And so that's why you can have um, you know, a, a police officer arrest someone, put him in jail, and a um, and, and a judge say, "Yeah, you need to, you know, face whatever consequences," and then have a pastor come and say to them, "But you're forgiven, but you still need to serve your sentence." All right? And we run into it's so easy to mix when we're talking about faith matters to mix politics in with it. Right, um, and and what we end up doing is using a bandage for strep throat. You can't you can't take when when you're dealing with with faith matters, you can't apply a political solution to it. Right, and so so it's really important to um, on the one hand keep those two things separate. Right, but on the other hand recognize this is all part of God's kingdom. And um, I mean, like I'm still wrapping my head around this, and and figuring this out. But but in fact, even when we think about this, um, and this was my note to, to my friend was that um, that not only is that true of those two kingdoms, it's also true of what we call the kingdom of glory, right? Heaven, the resurrection. And there's a really fine line between the two. So when you look at, and look, this is a great exercise. You go back and you read all the different places where the Bible, especially the New Testament, Jesus, um, different sermons and things like that, where he talks about the kingdom of God, right? And oftentimes when he says the kingdom of God is like, usually when you look at it, it looks like, well, when we think kingdom of God, we usually think of heaven, but... What he's really talking about here, when you look at it, he's really talking about earth. But then if you read it again, you might realize that, well, no, this is just how God's kingdom works everywhere, heaven and earth. That, that really what we're talking about is bringing what we think of as heaven to earth, is bringing the... Um, the, the presence of God through us, bringing the message of grace, bringing, you know, this is, this is how God established things to work. And you always have to start at the gospel, and we've talked about that. And, and so, um, so this even, uh, there was uh, the question was asked, okay, so what about somebody who, is um, uh, they're they're getting in all kinds of trouble. They're coming to you for help. You you want to be there for them and and accept them and 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 show them you love them. But at the same time, you don't want to condone negative behavior. All right. Well, this gets back to what we've talked about with belong, believe, behave. All right. You got to start at belonging. I love you. I'm here for you, and I'm here for you no matter what. I love you with no strings attached, right? And no matter what you do, I still care about you. I still love you. I'm, there's, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna do something that's gonna cause me to stop caring about you. It's impossible, right? 
and I want you to see that. And 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 this is whether it's a situation like that, or whether it's uh, um, with parenting, or, or or anything like that, where you have someone in, in sort of a mentoring relationship, um, that you um, it's it's not I love you, but it's I love you therefore. Right? It's not I love you, but you got to stop doing that. Because that kind of come across as, and if you don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop loving you. Or like there's some sort of disconnect between I want you to stop doing that and I love you. No, I love you, because, but I see I, I love you, and therefore I want you to stop doing this because I see how destructive it is in your life. Right? And so in a situation like that where you, you have this sort of negative stuff, you, you want to change that, right? Because it's, it's harmful, it's destructive, right? In a situation like that, what you want to do is you want, is you want to say, all right, so what are, what are your goals in life? What do you want to accomplish? What are your dreams? What, if, if, you, could, if you could just start fresh today, what would you like to see happen in your life? If you had, if, if, if there were no, if there was nothing at all that said, no, you can't, what would you do? What would, what would your end goal be? Right? And then, let's have some time to think about that. Then you say, okay, so what needs to happen to get there? And I'm here for you to help you achieve your dreams. Right? Because I love you. Right? And if there's stuff that's going to get in the way of that, then I'm going to help you recognize that. That that's destructive. And that's going to stop you from getting where you want to get. And, um, and, you know, and so... So this is, this is all, this is, because ultimately what I want you to experience even before you die is heaven on earth or the closest approximation you can get to it, right? And so I want you to experience God's grace in ways that you've never experienced it before. I want you to experience love in, in ways that you never thought possible. I want you to, um, to experience the fulfillment of what God has called, the calling that God has placed on your life, right? And I'm here for you to help you achieve that. I'm here for you, and it's not something you have to do on your own. We're all in this together. And, um, and so when you start to see how these, what we even call different kingdoms, are actually all the same kingdom, and see the connection between them, it's actually really beautiful. Um, but again, I'm still wrapping my head around it too. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing, and it's, I mean, literally within just the past few months that it really kind of struck me how all this stuff is connected. Um, and, uh, and, and so I'm still, I'm still figuring it out. Um, and that's, I mean, that's part of this too, is don't be afraid to say, I'm still figuring it out. All right. Um, so I, I already hit on this, but life begins at the cross, lead with the gospel. Um, and, you know, when we think of Exodus 20, right? When I think of Exodus 20, at least I think Ten Commandments, right? But here's how the Ten Commandments start. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then he says, you shall have no other gods, and, you know, and so forth. So he starts out with, you're already free. I've already saved you. You are no longer a slave. All right? And I know that you really don't want to be a slave. Not just to Egypt, but to yourself and to Satan and, and all of the destructive things in this world. You don't want to be a slave to that. All right? And so here's my commandments. That, all right? You, you follow these. These are all about freedom. These are all about, this is what freedom looks like. Now, in our sinful minds, we twist them around and go, oh, no, that's, that's chains. That's not freedom. Freedom is doing what I want. No, drinking poison is not freedom. 
right? If you drink poison, it is gonna, it's gonna do everything about taking away your freedom. All right? And that's true of every single sin. It may look, you know, this is tasty poison. Great. <laughs> However, it's going to kill you. All right? And so, but it, it all comes back to not you must do these things or you will be judged, whether by God or by me, but rather, this is freedom. I want you to have freedom. I want you to have hope. I want you to have peace and joy and like, like all this stuff that, that the world does not even understand, does not believe that these things truly exist, not on the level that we can experience in Christ. And, and so, um, <clears throat> so when we lead with the gospel, when we always lead with the gospel, then you're, you're, you're starting from the point where the law comes from, right? This gets back to when I was, when I was at seminary, and, and they said, you know, there's this kind of, um, there's this dichotomy with God because there's his glory, and then there's his grace. And his glory is, you know, like, oh, you can't look at me or you'll die. You know, it's, it's, it's some pretty heavy law. And, um, but then there's this grace, and I was like, well, that seems like kind of a contradiction. And they said, well, we, you know, we hold these two things in tension. I said, well, okay. But the more I thought about it, again, this is something that I've been thinking about for years, and, and I've kind of arrived at the conclusion that, that no, God's glory is gospel too. Because this is what he has for us. He invites us to share in that glory. And so, you know, so yes, it's law in the sense that we recognize that is not me right now. But that is not me according to my sinful nature. But because I'm a baptized child of God, that's me. So even Jesus says, and this which directly ties in with this whole outreach conversation, in one place Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. And in another place he says, you're the light of the world. Wait a minute, did you just contradict yourself, Jesus? No, because he's given us that light and he shines that light through us. And in fact, he says, you can't cover it up. City on a hill can't be hidden. You can try to cover it up. People are still going to see you. And they're still going to see me and you. Right? So, yeah, don't, don't lead with the law. Don't lead with judgment. This kind of goes back to that, that, first, um, that first point. All right, so what about identity? Um, you know, Jesus said, who do you say I am? And, um, and I was, uh, a number of years ago, I was talking to uh, a guy that I knew online from some discussion groups, and, um, and he was uh, um, a, a, a Eastern Orthodox. And, um, and I was, you know, kind of talking about, like, so, you know, what are, what are the differences and, you know, and what do we have in common and things? And um, he said, he said, you know, you as a Lutheran are a product of the Protestant Reformation. But Orthodox severed with Rome long before that, a thousand years before that. And so Protestants tend to focus on salvation. Have I told you guys this? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> he said, you tend to focus on how are you saved? That's kind of your, your core question. He said, because, because it's a reaction to, um, to Rome and, and indulgences and, you know, and all that stuff. All right? And so he says, well, we never went through that. So where we come from, our core question is not how are you saved, but who do you say that I am? Who's Jesus? Huh, that's really fascinating. And I realized that neither one of those places is a bad place to start. Right? And in fact, there's pros and cons to both of them. 
right? But the more I thought about it, the more I thought about that question, and I realized that with that question, as, and especially as Lutherans, we ask another question, and that is, who does he say that I am? Right? But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. Right? Because it's not just about who Jesus is, it's about who he says we are. He says we're his own. And for Lutherans, I mean, man, we go to baptism and say, that's who I am. He called me by name there. He placed his name on me. <laughs> this, uh, this past Sunday, we had baptism in church. And, um, and my, my daughter Emma was, was, was watching. She's just kind of soaking all this in. We get all done with the baptism liturgy, and she goes, that was awesome. <laughs> that's great. I was like... <laughs> You're six. <laughs> but it was just like, it, it was like she realized that she was in the present, that something amazing had just happened. And, um, and so we, it, it allowed us to have this great conversation on the way home and over lunch and stuff about, and especially with my kids being able to talk about adoption and, and say, um, you know, we, when we're, um, before, before you were adopted into our family, um, you know, one of the things that happened when you were adopted is you got a new name. You became a Critchley. Well, in baptism, what you saw today, that little baby got adopted into God's family. And God gave that little baby his name. And, got, and when you were baptized, God gave you his name too. Really? So then they're like, wow, we have a lot of names. Like we have our first name and our middle name and our last name and our nickname and, <laughs> and we have God's name. Like, yeah. And it was just like, you know, there's sort of soaking this all in. It's, like, it's amazing. And so, um, so, you know, when we talk to people, when we talk about identity and, and where we're coming from, um, and, and, you know, and oftentimes our world does terrible things to our identity and tells us that we're worthless tells us that we're not enough, that we're, um, that we're incapable, that, that we're bad. Um, and I, you just spend any time, amount of time on, um, on social media and you'll see how good everybody else is and start comparing yourself to them and, and go, oh, yeah, I don't measure up, All right? I can, look at, um, I can look at my parenting, I can look at my... Um, you know, how, how I've been as a husband. I mean, you name it, pick the role. And, and I can tell you, you don't need to tell me my failures, I can tell you all of them, right? And, um, and, and, and I tell myself them over and over, right? But that's not who Jesus says I am. I'm not my failures, all right? And so for people that are, you know, that, that feel that way, that, you know, this is one of those, those opportunities where someone goes, oh man, I really messed up. We have the unique opportunity to say, but what you have done is not who you are. God offers you a new name, a new identity. And so we have the opportunity to, I mean, you know, and, and this is one of those, look at the situation, look at the conversation, right? But identity is huge, and it's something that we struggle with so much in our culture of what is our identity and, and who is what and all this kind of stuff. It's like, well, yeah, those are all really challenging questions and, and stuff. And, um, but ultimately, the identity that God offers us is bigger than any other identity that we have. And, um, and so when we can communicate that, when, when we have the opportunity to... Um, where someone is feeling inadequate, worthless, whatever, to say, no, that's not who you are. Let me tell you who you are. And, um, and, and it, just to, again, with, you know, with the gospel and, and those words of comfort. And it's about relationship. It's, it's back to what we're talking about, not wanting a debate. Which means even if you say, no, but this is who you are. They say, no, I'm not. <laughs> but 
because I don't believe that. <laughs> well, okay. But you know what? This is how I'm going to treat you, okay? Because that's who I believe you are. And so, because I believe that you are someone that God considered to be of infinite value, I'm going to treat you that way to the best of my ability. And if I don't, that is my failure, not yours. And you can call me on it. Listen and identify with commonalities. Acts 17. As I passed along, as Paul, um, and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So he had the, the Greeks and they had all their, their altars to all kinds of different gods and stuff like that, but they thought, okay, well, these are the gods that we know of, right? You got Zeus and, and Hermes and Aphrodite, Aphrodite and Hera and, and all those. What if we forgot somebody? Like, we don't want that god to be mad that we skipped that one. So we'll just, like, have the altar of the unknown god. Like, if, all right, anybody, if we forgot you, that's you, all right? Or if we don't know about you, that's for you, all right? And so Paul, he comes along, and, and he's, and now understand, you talk about meeting people where they're at, all right? These people he were talking to, like, these are the guys that would hang out in the square, in the town square, and, um, and they're like philosophers and stuff. Like, they were into discussing this stuff. This is, this is the same as going to Comic-Con and talking about Star Wars, right? This was their thing. And so, um, so he goes there and he says, okay, hey, you guys talk about this. I saw this altar with this unknown god. Well, like, actually, I know who this unknown god is. Let me tell you about him. His name is Jesus. All right? So he met them where they're at based on what they had in common. All right? He was trained in philosophy. He was trained in, like, he knew this, these principles. He used, if you, if you look at um, kind of Aristotle and, and you know, all the, these kind of philosophies that were popular at the time, um, you can see Paul uses a lot of the same, like, he'll use their terminology. And, um, and in fact, John did, too. In fact, we, we see... Um, this, uh, in the beginning, uh, John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he goes on, and the Word became flesh. All right, that concept, that, that Greek word logos, um, is, <clears throat> is based on um, kind of the Greek understanding of where the universe came from. That, that there was this, this, this energy or something unknown, this, this thing that was called the logos, the word, the, the story, the message. And, um, and, and this is kind of part of their understanding of how things came about. And, and you know, so, so John 1, what he's actually saying is, yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. And like, you're on the right track. Let me tell you this, this unknown logos you can actually know him because he became human. Which beautifully, I mean, and, and it's not that, that he somehow compromised the message, all right? What he did is, you know, he's, he's going all the way back to Genesis where God spoke creation. Where he's, and, and he says, yeah, all things were created through the word. The spoken and, and I found this another thing where we talk about you know the different kingdoms they're all really one kingdom. I've also found that it's dangerous to separate the written word from the word became flesh. That they're they're tied together. And of course, I mean you know it's it's on, on the one hand you're like well no these are a Bible and Jesus are two different things, and yet Jesus speaks to us through the written and spoken word, and um, and where you see. This um, talking about the word, you know, Jesus is the message. He is the embodiment of that message. And um, and so so when when people draw the distinction, I, I I'm always I always kind of go, okay, but let's let's take a look at that distinction now. 
because there's not as much of a distinction there as you think there is. Right? People hear with their hearts before their heads. Uh, Romans 12, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. And that, that last line is, is like, no really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, because I've seen this over and over. Um, a great example, there was a, um, there was a concert, uh, Marilyn Manson, well-known, very anti-Christian message and, and stuff like that. And, um, and, and he was coming into town, his churches were kind of like, you know, you know rally and, and, and protest and all this kind of stuff. And, and um, so, so there was one church, though, that um, decided, let's make sandwiches. We'll make sandwiches and have, like, I don't know, lemonade or, or whatever for all the concert goers. And so this church showed up at the, um, at the arena outside in the parking lot, and they had enough sandwiches for everybody and and, and gave it all away for free and said, here you go. You know, uh, we, just, we just wanted to show you guys God's love and, uh, you know, help yourself. And, um, and, and so Marilyn Manson, during the concert, actually thanked the church for their kindness. <laughs> Someone who comes in and like his, it's got this just, just this really harsh message, anti-Christian message and stuff like that, had to thank a church. <laughs> Didn't have to, but it's like, yeah, you know, when you show people what real love is and that you're not just all about being against everything and protesting everything and stuff, and you go, I'm just gonna love you where you're at, then, man, it's amazing. I've heard of churches doing that when the Westboro Baptist Church comes down to town too. The, they find out that these, they're gonna come and protest their church, so they make them sandwiches. And, and for all the, because then when the news gets out that they're coming to town, then you get counter protesters to come in too and, and stuff like that. They, just, they make sandwiches for everybody. Here you go. Welcome. It's great, because you, know, you think like, who, who looks good and who looks bad at that point? You know, I mean, these people are, 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 they're being attacked and they turn around and show grace. And they bless and do not curse them. And people go, huh. Wow. <laughs> that's weird, but that's so cool. <laughs> All right. Don't dumb it down, but don't feed a steak to a baby. All right. Listen and ask questions. Um, See where people are coming from. And, um, and don't, on the one hand, don't ever be afraid when someone asks to tell you, to tell them what you believe. Right? If they're asking, they want to know. Right? At the same time, don't give them more than they can handle at once. Right? There's a tendency, and I, I'm terrible about this, I think it goes with being a preacher, right? There's a whole joke that the kid goes and asks, the pastor's kid goes and asks mom this theological question, and she says, why don't you ask your dad that? Because I didn't want to know that much about it. <laughs> right. um, you know, I, and, and I'm used to just, oh, I could go on and on about it. You know, pick your topic. And I love to. It's, I, it, I just, it energizes me. Right? But at the same time, know when to quit. Um, know when you've said enough. In other words, answer the question, and unless they're asking follow-up questions, don't just like inundate them and overwhelm them and intimidate them. Um, and, and you notice that with Jesus, when, um, 
when people would ask him questions, he'd usually answer the question with a question. All right, that's brilliant because number one, it asks where people are coming from. All right, but it also helps them to get to to get to their own conclusion. And this goes back to what we talked about: um, show people how to think and not what to think. Right? If you can help them to find the truth on their own. If you can ask them questions to make them stop and think and question their own um, views, and they'll say, no, this is the way it is. But rather, you know, why do you, why do you see it that way? Have you considered this? Have you considered this aspect of what you're seeing? Not talking about the way you see it, but rather look at the way they see it and, um, and say, all right, I'm having a hard time understanding this part of it. Could you explain that to me? I'm a, I, I see how you got to this point, but then there's sort of, to me, it seems like kind of a leap to get from this point to the next. And it seems a little inconsistent. Can you explain to me how you got from one point to the next? And um, and uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, this is with talking to people who are Muslims. All right. Um, according to sort of the doctrine of Islam, the, um, the the God gave His gospel. Right. But the gospel has been corrupted. And uh, so, for example. Um, you know, we we point to the to the Bible, and it says that um, that the the promised land, the and and the the the, the promise was to go from uh, Abraham to Isaac, and they say no, that was corrupted. It actually went to Ishmael, and when you hit points like that, or or for that matter, did Jesus die on the cross? And they say no, he. God would not allow his prophet to be, you know, to, to be killed like that. Uh, he just, he swooned, he, uh, he passed out or whatever, but didn't actually die. Well, remembering that for, um, for Islam, their core doctrine is the sovereignty of God. Like that's, there's no God but Allah and, and Muhammad is his prophet, right? And there's no God with Allah means that, that he is supreme. Okay? Nothing happens without him allowing it. But to say that, that Allah's gospel was corrupted, you stop thinking about it, that's heresy. How could, how could you say that, Allah's, that Allah was not capable of keeping his gospel pure. All right? You don't have to answer that question. You don't have to say it's heresy either. All right? But you can ask that question just to get him to stop and think. All right? Because all of us, everybody, there's certain things that we think just because we heard it and it sounded good to us. And we didn't really think it through. That's true of all of us, right? And, um, and so, so it's good to, to stop and think about, um, number one, it's, it's always a good, uh, good exercise to, to sort of challenge your own. As this is, you know, talking to people who don't believe the same way and, and letting them ask you questions. And boy, have there have been times where someone has questioned one of my conclusions that was, it wasn't really a conclusion, it was just something I'd been told. And, uh, and I never really questioned it, and they questioned it, and I went, hmm, that's a good point. It was a bit of a faith crisis for me. But what it did is it drove me into the Word, which is a great place to go in a faith crisis. And I came out stronger. Right? It also drove me to talk to other Christians. It drove me to the church, which is also another great place to go in a faith crisis, right? And so we have it, we've got the word of God um, at those times. We don't have to be afraid of questions, right? Um, 
But asking questions is a great way. Because if a person feels like they got there on their own, I'm not talking about tricking them or making them think that, you know, that they thought of it on their own, but they really didn't or something like that. But just, you know, to, to ask those questions, to, to get them to stop and think. Because that, if nothing else, is gonna to lead to better conversations. And let the chips fall where they may. Right? A lot of those questions. Um, I, a number of years ago, saw a presentation by, um, darn it, I just forgot his name. Um, he used to be one of the vice presidents of the Church of the Missouri Synod um, and is a professor of ancient history at uh, was the University of Kalamazoo or something like that. And I just drew a blank on his name. I can picture him. But anyway, um, very well respected historian. Um, and uh, and it was in his presentation, he said, you know, some people go over to Israel to do archaeology to prove that the Bible is wrong. They should have their shovels taken away. Some people go over to Israel to do archaeology to prove the Bible is right. They should have their shovels taken away too. All right? You should do honest archaeology and let the chips fall where they may. Because if what we believe is true, and I believe it is, then the evidence will support the truth. The evidence will point to the truth. And in fact, you look at biblical archaeology throughout the, you know, throughout the ages, and it is repeatedly pointed to the historicity of the Bible. Right? Well, that applies to anything. Don't be afraid of questions. Don't be afraid of, of you know, trying to, to sort through things. Don't be afraid of, of something coming along that you're going to go, hmm, I don't know. Right? Also recognize, especially if you're talking about archaeology, that sometimes where you see this sort of, well, here's this thing and it's a contradiction. Wait for it. All right? Because oftentimes what happens is, they discover something, you go, oh look, this is this this piece of evidence shows that this part of the Bible is wrong. Wait for it. Alright, keep digging. And then pretty soon they find, you know, the rest of the pot or or you know, or whatever it is, and they go, Oh, we didn't have the whole puzzle. Now we have more of it. Oh, and now, yeah, it, it does kind of point to the or, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of, there's, there's stuff where, that I've looked at where it just depends how you interpret the evidence. Um, I was having a discussion with a friend who's not a Christian about Jericho. If you look at the, uh, the archaeology connected to Jericho, some people look at the evidence and say, it looks like when Joshua came through, Jericho was abandoned. All right? But then they kept digging in and they found some more stuff. And, and those people, a lot of them are still saying, no, you can, you can still interpret it to say it was abandoned. But there's other people that go, no, this looks like it was a thriving city at the time. You know, sometimes the evidence, like the archaeology, it's hard to tell. Okay, well, you know what? That's not just true of archaeology. There's other things where you're gonna to come to different, you know, people are gonna to come to different conclusions. And then <clears throat> there's times where you just have to say, you know, I think we're gonna to have to just, we, we, we're interpreting the evidence differently, all right? And I can see where you're coming from, I can see how you interpret it that way. This is why I interpret it. And you can talk about, you know, what's the difference? Um, and and why, why do you come to that conclusion? Why do I come to this conclusion? And maybe you can find some common ground or at least um, a better understanding of each other. And, and a, as you get a better understanding of where they're coming from, that in the future can lead to other conversations that, where you can get just deep in that relationship, make better connections. And keep listening. I know, like, I'm hammering this, all right? I've been hammering this for five months now, right? All right, but keep listening. 
and um, and and just let keep looking for where people are coming from, um, and, and understanding what's motivating you. What's why do you see things that way? Where, how did you come to that conclusion? What what went what happened in your past that that caused you to think that way? What um, you know what have you heard that has influenced you? Uh, you know, there's just so many influences on our lives, and you can't just you can't just take away those influences. All right, they're there. What you can do is is just is be a gospel influence as part of that mix. For years, I, I was a Christian by name and not really by practice so much. Um, I really didn't know what it really meant to have a relationship with Christ until I was in my early 20s. I just developed a, a desire and a hunger just to just do it, you know, be a light and, and have others come to know Christ in a real and personal way. And uh, just this calling on my life to... Uh, to be active as a Christian and, and live it as a lifestyle and not just on a Sunday or once or twice, you know, a week type of deal. My wife and I started this apartment life ministry where we live in the apartment community and give 80 hours a month to the community um, to help develop that sense of community um, in the apartment complex. And through that, we were able to build relationships our Bible studies and hopefully assimilate people to a local church. It's an incredible opportunity to uh, serve as a family, just to be in service together. And it, it's just a, a good lesson in, in uh, living the life of a Christian. It's lifestyle evangelism. It's um, building relationships with people around you that live next door across the way. And, and for us, it's just really a, a challenged us to... Uh, live out our faith on a very practical and real level. Change the world together. This is this is one of the most effective ways when you have the opportunity to share Christ with people is to invite them to change the world with you. All right? Because there's this thing, most people, they want, they want to make the world a better place. All right? They recognize the value of that. All right? And if you give them the opportunity, and it's, a, it's in a way that you say, hey, let's go do this together. <clears throat> you're showing God's love. And you're giving them a taste of God's love. And, and, and God's love is complete in the receiving and the giving. And we were made in God's image. Right? And you now we've, we've lost that because of sin. But through baptism, it's restored now and not yet. All right, so we have it, but yet it'll be in a new creation. It'll be even more greater fulfilled, okay? But we're still, we were still created that way. And so God's image is, we think about who is God. All right, number one, God is a trinity, so he is community. All right? God made us for community. That's why the first, when he said, created everything, he said, it's all good. First time he said it's not good is when he said it's not good for man to be alone. Why? Because we were created for community. All right? This is why I always emphasize that faith was never made for a vacuum. All right? We need each other. And so serving together is giving a person a taste of that. All right? But it's also God's love all right? Why does God love us? Because he loves to love us. All right? Because God is love. And, and love is experienced both in the receiving and the giving. And, um, and, and it is a joy to show love to others. And so when you can do that, when you can 
when you can go out and, and change the world together, maybe one soup all at a time. What you're doing is you're giving that person a taste of God's love. Right? And, and so, so even if they don't you know, recognize the connection, they're giving a taste of it. Right? And, and the, the problem a lot of people have with God's love is that they don't believe that it exists. They don't believe it can exist. They, such a love can exist because they haven't experienced it. Well, give them a chance to experience it. Even if it's them that are actually showing the love to someone else, right? So whether it's you know having a doing a um, this sort of apartment complex you know group or, or whatever like that, where they're actually just you know serving each other and, and just bringing people together, right? It could be um, you know it could be going out and doing some kind of charitable work, right? It can even be borrowing your neighbor's clippers giving them an opportunity to show love to you by saying hey I, I noticed that you have this garden tool and I don't have one would it be okay if I borrowed it and, and the funny you know um, this is uh, one of our epistle readings recently uh, I think um where Paul says, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. We don't have, in the, we don't have that in the Gospels anywhere, all right? But Paul had heard it somewhere else, whether it was directly from Jesus or, you know, through the, the various stories that went around and just never actually got written down. Um, but, like, I, I, I thought a lot about that over the years, and, and so what does that mean? And, and you know, for a long time I thought, well, you know, it's like, like you give of yourself and, and, and God goes, good boy. Very good. Nice job. All right. It's your blessing. All right. But no, actually, it's more blessed to give than to receive because giving is inherently blessing. All right. When, when someone else you know, when someone offers to do something nice for me, all right, often my, my sort of gut re response is to go, no, 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 I, I got it, all right? But normally, un, un, under most circumstances, if I, say, if I don't let them do something that they want to do for me, that, that I actually need, not, you know, something like, no, that's going to make my life miserable, actually, but, you know, um, but... If I, if I say, no, I'll do it myself, I'm taking away their blessing. Right? Because if they're able to love me and serve me, then they're going to experience the blessing of giving love. And if, if I keep it to myself and go, no, no, I've got it, I just stop them from giving love and I just stop myself from receiving love. And we were made to love each other. And so if someone wants to do something, it's not selfish to let someone do something nice for you or to ask someone for help. And, and so, you know, that's, part of this is, is not just what you do for your neighbors, but certainly if, if your neighbors, whoever, however you define your neighbor, your, you know, your actual uh, neighborhood, you know, neighbors, your coworkers, whatever, um, certainly, if you have the opportunity to do something for them, do it, all right? But if you have the opportunity to give them the opportunity to do something for you in a way that they're going to feel blessed to be able to do that for you, let them thank them, all right? Let them experience that love. It's... It, we can get so hung up on, well, I need to go out and be sacrificial that we think that it's all about me. And it's actually really selfish and prideful when you do that. All right. Where do you need help? Um, 
there's certain certain other questions uh, that you have, other situations, other, yeah. So um, I have a situation where, you know, I've kind of had someone on my list and um, I can even use help, like how to pray for someone, I mean, what words to use and stuff. But um, listening to all of this, I think when I have a history with someone, maybe I'm not the right person to be that person to them because um, it was almost kind of like your story about baby Christians. I think I'm a baby at this, and I gotta maybe start with someone I don't have a history with, so that I just accept them at face value. And and because I'm pretty weak, I fall back immediately into my own agenda. And mm -hmm. I don't know that. I think that's what I got the most out of tonight is that I've been getting in my own. I mean, I've been getting in the way, you know. Sure, and you know, and sometimes we, we talk about that. How sometimes it's it's somebody else, you know. So you look for the opportunities, and and maybe you, maybe maybe your job in that person's life, that God has put you in their life to show them love, mm -hmm. so that someone else can come into their life, and tell them love, and then they go, oh yeah, I know what that is, I've experienced that. Mm -hmm. Well. So a, ver a variation on, on, on that theme. I, I get the idea of I love you unconditionally. And it's not I love you but. Mm -hmm. I, I heard that. Where I trip is the notion of I love you, I cannot endorse your behavior. You know, drugs and whatever, whatever might be happening with, with an individual you're interacting with, mm -hmm. and and boy, I tell you, it's really and it, it's really hard to, to sort of say, to sort of live what you're saying. I love you unconditionally. I'm not going to support this behavior, you know, but I love you. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and how and how do you how do you do that without that big but in there? Uh -huh. I love you, but Remember, your behavior is unacceptable. It's because, man, that's hard. Yes, it is. All right. I, I mean, <laughs> let's, let's, let's be clear that you know it is hard. All right. There's a reason that we have the Beatitudes, where Jesus says, you know, this, 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 and this. Yes, you're still blessed. Even when you're like, <laughs> you're still blessed. God's still there for you. He still loves you. This is not easy. All right, there's a reason that it's called spiritual warfare. <laughs> All right? It's hard. All right? And, and that's the beauty of the gospel is that you will fail. And God forgives you. And he loves you. He says, you're mine. And nothing you can do is going to change that. Right? This is, why, this is why we spent an entire session on preparation, spiritual growth, and, and stuff like that. Right? Because this is hard. It's taxing. It's draining. All right? Even though loving others is joy, it's hard. It can be exhausting. Right? It's the world we live in. Paul says, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. Right? If it ain't hard, it ain't a sacrifice. Right? David said, I won't offer anything to God that costs me nothing. Right? There's a cost. There is a price. Right? Yes. It's absolutely true. This side of heaven is going to be a price, and it's often going to be high. Right? And then, but then you go, but is it worth it? Is it worth the cost? All right. And, and so, you know, we find ourselves, you know, sometimes when you get into that conversation, you find yourself in a corner. 
you find it, this is hard. All right? And yeah, it's true. And that's why, and that's the value of, of keep going back and, and, and needing the word, needing the spirit to not just speak through you, but to speak to you. You know, I, I said one of, the, one of the things that I love about being at a church with more than one pastor is that every, um, either every other week or, or, or even every, you know, two out of three weeks, right? I get to hear the absolution spoken to me. Now, I know when I speak it to the congregation that that's for me too, right? But it's different when it's someone else saying it to you. For the same reason you can't tickle yourself. <laughs> right? And, and so I need that. Right? I desperately need it because I can't fill from an empty bucket. And there's plenty of days that I feel really empty. And, um, and man, when you're feeling empty, and all of a sudden God comes along with the gospel and goes, dump. And you're just like, oh, oh, that's great. And so even, even when you feel completely exhausted, when you feel like, oh, this is hard, I can't do this, all right? Even that you can rejoice in. Right? Just like the, the early Christians, when they're being fed to the lions at Sergius Maximus, not the Colosseum, that's it. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they would rejoice. They would, like, people could, the Romans couldn't figure it out. They'd send these Christians out there, and the Christians, you know, they'd be, they'd, they'd be down on their knees praying, and out come the lions, and they're just like, oh, thank you, God. And then, and then people are like, what? <laughs> right? They're going, I was given the honor of being a witness to Christ and, and dying as a, you know, as a witness to, to him, as a witness to the resurrection in front of all these people. What an honor. Right? Well, you might not get fed to the lions. I hope you're not. Chances are you won't. Right? But are there times where you're going to have to make a sacrifice like that? Yeah. What an honor that God says, you, I want, you're the one that I'm going to use. So, so, yeah, in those situations where you go, but, but this, you know, this behavior is destructive. Back to the gospel. I love you. God has freedom for you. He has given this to you. He paid a high price to give it to you because he loves you so much. Right? And it just kills me to see you put the chains back on. I want that freedom for you. How can I help you be free? Right? It's hard. Because just like the, you know, you look at the Israelites, they got, he sets them free and, and they go, you know, when we were in Egypt, we had leeks and onions and vegetables and all this stuff free. We didn't have to pay for it. You were slaves. <laughs> you didn't have to pay for it because you didn't have anything. Everything you had belonged to, to Egypt. And you paid with your blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> you know, man, drove Moses nuts, drove God nuts. <laughs> right? I've got freedom for you. You want the chains. What are you doing? Right? And we do have a ton of something we learned in, in our foster care classes. Right? So you have a kid that's, um, that's in a... Uh, uh, a home where it's just like arguing all the time and fighting and abuse and, and all kinds of stuff, right? And you put them, what happens when you put them in a stable home? They, they're scared. And they're scared, yeah. They're like, what? What's going on? This is not right. This, like, this is a powder keg. 
or like, I don't know how to deal with this. Conflict I can deal with. This I can't. Now, they're not consciously thinking this way. All right? But what they'll actually do is they will start to, like, cause problems. They'll start to, to try to, like, put a wedge between the parents and, and, and stuff like that to try to get them to fight with each other because that's what they know. And so, so then what you have to do then as a foster parent is, is go, no, that's not how we do things here. All right? And we're just going to keep on showing you what a loving, stable home looks like until you get used to it. And you go, oh, this is actually pretty good. And it takes a long time. And for some, it takes years. For some, it takes a lifetime. But over time, you at least start to recognize, huh, there's something to this. At least, what else? This isn't as bad as I thought. You know, it's baby steps, right? So yeah, I mean, you don't, while well, you don't condone behavior, remember, our goal for them is not behave. Our goal for them is, is to belong and then believe. The behave will come. That doesn't mean you need to encourage the negative behavior, right? But at the same time, say, you know what? You mess up. I'm still going to love you, right? It tears me apart when you do this because I see what you're doing to yourself. And I care too much about you to, um, to just to not say something. I love you. But yeah, it, it goes back to, to what ultimately, what is our goal for them? Our goal for them is to know Jesus and his love. And, um, you know, and so it's a matter of communicating that however God gives us the opportunity. A couple other, we're running out of time, and a couple other points that I want to hit. And one is the Holy Spirit, not you. Right? You cannot, I had an atheist friend talking about, you know, something about me trying to convince him to believe or, you know, or something like that. I said, I can't. I can't. I, I know I can't. It's not my goal to convince you to believe or, or anything like that. I can't do it. Only the Holy Spirit can do it. And I'm not so arrogant to think that, that I can do it on my own. He's like, well, it kind of plays out the same way, doesn't it? <laughs> But, but what it comes down to is that is we are not called to change hearts. We're called to love. The Holy Spirit changes hearts. Right? And so at the end of the day, or at the end of a lifetime, if those hearts aren't changed, that's not on you. No matter how much you've messed up along the way, So often, I get done preaching a sermon, and I go, "Man, that was terrible." <laughs> I was, oh, I, you know, and I, I can just there's a, a hundred different things that come to mind that I could have said better. And I go, ah, oh, you know, the flow was off, and the, the, you know, this and that, and and it seems like the ones that I feel the worst about and think, man, I just like, excuse me, I need to just go into a closet somewhere and get on my knees and beg God for forgiveness. Those are the ones that people come on and go. That was exactly what I needed to hear. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, <laughs> what? Oh, because it's not about me. Because God can, well, God can take can talk out of Balaam's donkey. He can talk out of me and accomplish His purpose in spite of me. 
Trust God. Be patient. This is a long game. All right? When you talk about how do you pray for somebody, God, I want to know your love. Help me. And, and it takes us back to the Lord's Prayer. God, let your name be hallowed among us. Let, let our lives bring glory to your name. Let, let your kingdom come through us. Let your will be done among us. Let us have that kind of faith. You know, and, and um, um, God, this is, this is, this is all, it all comes down to you. I'll, it was Luther that said, um, work as if it all depends on you, pray as if it all depends on God. And I would say, pray because it all depends on God. <clears throat> it's okay to say, I don't know. In fact, humility goes a really long way. It's okay to, I mean, you know, people have questions about stuff. And whether it's, <laughs> why do you... Why do you do that? Why do you, how did you get to that conclusion? Why do you believe that? You know, whatever. And you know what? There's going to be times where you just have to say, I don't know. Do you mind if I, you know, think about that, look into it a little bit, and get back to you? That's an opportunity right there. That's saying, hey, let's, this is, this is right here is asking permission to have another one of those conversations. All right? That's an awesome opportunity. All right? We're the church. We're not in this alone. We're here for each other. And um, I, as an introvert, am terrible about this. Um, that I notice you check this out when you when you walk into um, into the sanctuary like right before the service starts and you see like there's like all these islands of people I don't know, I don't know what that's about but I do it too <laughs> and I don't, I don't know why um, but you have like sort of families who sit together and stuff but there's not a lot of like we sort of, we don't really clump unless we have to. Um, we're, we're so individualized that, um, and then, but the, like when you, when, when church is packed and you have to sit next to people, like, that's awesome. <laughs> hey, everybody's singing together and, and, and it's beautiful. And I think, why do we, why do we only do that when we're forced to? Because we're, we're really, we're, we're such individuals that we forget the blessing of the church, right? And when it comes down to, you know, these conversations uh, with other people, you're not even alone. And sometimes it is, hey, you know what? Um, I'd like you to meet my friend. Um, I, I think you guys have really hit it off. Um, and you know, do that. And, and it's not just about inviting people. You know, uh, you know. Sometimes you have the opportunity to invite someone to to come to a worship service. And if someone that's never had any experience with church, it's kind of a cool opportunity, but it might really freak them out because. I mean, just for example, um, a worship service, a Christian worship service is one of the only places in our entire culture where people sing together. Right? Like, kind of at a concert, but then you're really, you, maybe you're singing along with the, the person up in front, but it's really more about hearing. It's not really about singing. It's just some people just like to sing along. All right? But, um, but like, there's certain things that... that people in a worship service that's just weird. But if, if you invite them and say, hey, um, you know, I'd like you to be my friend. And, um, you know, it may be that that's the person. 
that, um, that, that God's going to use. So if you see that connection, go, you know, bridge that. You rely on the church. That's why God gave us to each other. And when you fail, when you totally mess up, church is also where you go for forgiveness. To go, to, to confess your sin. You don't have to wait till Sunday, all right? You go to confess your sin to another Christian. Say, I need forgiveness. You'll be able to use the office of the keys and say, I forgive you all your sin. That's right, powerful stuff. Use it. It's a gift. Culture is people. People is persons. Most people's platform is persons, not culture. <clears throat> All right? Uh, so the difference between people and persons. A people? People is singular. It refers to a group of persons. All right? A little English grammar uh, kind of thing here. All right? But that group of people is made up of individual persons, all right? For most people, your platform, your, the position that God has put you in, all right, that should actually say most persons, right? Most persons' platform is individual persons. Not, I'm going to go out and change the culture but rather God put somebody in your life. Unless you're Billy Graham or you know somebody like that, um, God puts individuals in your life. He says, love this one. Love this one. And, uh, and realize that it's not up to you to change the culture. I, I get irritated by people that try and change the culture for the sake of the church, because that's not how it works. It's all about individual people. It's their persons, right? Um, and, and it goes back to what I said previously, don't expect the lost to act like they're not lost. Lead them to the shepherd. And then, you know, I just, to, to think that, that somehow people that don't have hope in Christ are gonna act like they have hope in Christ that's just ludicrous. Right? So, show them that hope. Love them. Love them until they're just completely stymied. What? This makes no sense. Where is this coming from? Let me tell you about Jesus. Because that's who you're experiencing. Sunday and Monday, between the sacred 
and the secular. We've been invited into parts of the world that a pastor or a traditional missionary will never see. We have conversations with people who would never set foot in a church. Whether we love or dread our work, we choose to turn the focus away from the toward the has for us. Church is not the only place we worship, and Sundays are not the only days in our calendars that have meaning. Every day on mission for God brings us great joy. Like the heroes before us, we can be modern-day Noahs and Josephs and Peters who are called with a purpose. God has designed us. He created us to work and to worship. For us, work is worship. So, Lutheran's called this vocation. This is your calling. Everyone has a different calling. And God puts different people in each of our lives. And he says, I love you. And now take that love. And recognize that love is best shared. Love is maximized, love is fulfilled in the giving and receiving, in the sharing, back and forth. And, um, and so we do that we have the opportunity to experience that love in a whole new way. So. Um, finally, I just want to uh, hit some um, uh, suggested media. You have a list on your, your handout there. Um, first of all, there's, there's a number of, of books. Um, uh, the first one is actually a downloadable ebook. It's free. Uh, I think you have to sign up with Exponential to get it. Um, they're a church planning um, organization, um, but this this book, one of it's it's actually pretty short. It's an ebook. Um, it's really good stuff. It has a lot of great tips for um, kind of just helping you see how this plays out in the workplace and other parts of your life. Uh, breaking the missional code. Your church can become missionary to your community. It's a little bit more geared toward uh, congregations, um, but it, it just helps adjust your, your perspective uh, to see how this plays out um, kind of in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and then uh, Joining Jesus on His Mission uh, by Greg Fink. He's got a bunch of stuff um, that's really good stuff. Tangible Kingdom by Hugh Halter. He's a, <laughs> he's a really fun guy, I've seen him speak. Um, I, I mentioned him earlier that um, he's uh, he he ends up he always ends up having all these people living in his house that are like not family and, and stuff, and he hates it because he's an introvert. But it's what God's called him to do over and over, <laughs> and and so he just loves the people, and um, it's kind of funny. Uh, Missional Renaissance, Changing the Scorecard for the Church. Again, that one's a little more geared toward church. And he comes to some conclusions at the end that I don't necessarily agree with. He doesn't have much use for pastors and that. But um, but uh, there's a lot of good stuff in, until he, um, until the end. Uh, building a Discipling Culture, Mike Breen. Uh, Mike Breen is the guy that kind of launched uh, what's called the Missional Movement in England. Uh, I've seen him speak too, just a, a brilliant guy. Um, there's a, he's got an organization called 3DM, um, which is, you see listed down here on the next uh, section. Um, and they, they have a Twin Cities uh, branch uh, that, that does a lot of good stuff. Um, so some blogs here. Uh, the first one is, is uh, just a list that um, here at St. James, the, it's, those letters is live as a local missionary. And you see that in the bulletin every Sunday. And it's just that, that list, and we just keep cycling through it. Um, that I came up with a number of years ago. Uh, Greg Fink, uh, his book is mentioned up there. If you Google him, he's got a, a blog called, um, oh shoot, no, I can't remember the name. Living F 411 or something like that, I can't remember. Um, the Verge Network has a lot of really good resources. Uh, I mentioned Hugh Halter, he has a blog. Lutheran Society for Missiology, is, they actually have a magazine uh, or a journal that comes out once a month. They've got a lot of good online resources too. Um, video, if you, um, some of the videos I've used throughout this, 
We're from Right Now Media, which if you don't have a subscription, let me know and um, we can get you a free subscription to that through the church. And, um, and all you gotta do is you go into the little search box and you type in missional. And there's just a ton of stuff there, uh, different videos. Um, the Soma community, follow that. They've got some really good videos on Verge Network too. Again, with all those, you just, um, if you look for anything like it says missional, um, that'll, that'll point you in the right direction. Um, if you like audio, I, I like audio because I can listen to it in the car. Um, the Exponential Podcast, they haven't updated it in years, but there's just a whole ton of, you can go through topics and just hit the ones that, uh, again, that's a church planning group, but there's a lot of stuff just about discipleship and, um, and individuals living out their, their faith and things. And you just go through and kind of download the ones that you're interested in. Um, the Six Podcast uh, also hasn't been updated in a while. Um, that uh, that sermon I mentioned um, before that I was listening to, uh, the the um, that pastor is the host of this podcast. It's called the Six because it's living the six days um, between Sundays, um, living out your faith, and um, it's just a lot of really good stuff, stories and uh, different things people have done and, and things like that, but also kind of hitting some of these, these different topics. Um, and then uh, beyond that, uh, you've probably heard me at some point talk about Disciple Quest, all right? Um, Disciple Quest is, is a uh, mentoring um, program um, that uh, is <clears throat> broken up into different missions, different topics. And one of those is missional outreach. And you don't have to do the whole Disciple Quest package, right? If you just want to focus on this one, you can. And it's it's kind of it's self-directed. You work with a mentor, which at this point would be me. And um, and uh, and and there's each step along the way. Um, as you work through it, you have different options of which one resonates the most with you. And uh, and so you can you can pick and choose each step along the way and um, and it'll just help you to figure out how does this stuff play out in my life. It's kind of a self-discovery kind of thing, but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, and then if, if uh, the, the sort of end of that is what we call a commissioned local missionary. And it's the idea of, of recognizing where, you know, where has God called me and, and what tools has he given me um, so that uh, so that you uh, eventually you say, all right, I'm, God has sent me as a missionary into, to be a local missionary into this place, right? And so to have the training and support and, and things that you need to, whether it's your workplace or uh, social area or, or whatever it is, um, and, and recognizing that. And then, um, and then if you really want to go in deep, uh, Disciple Quest is more than just one mission. It's the whole thing, and um, and there's there's actually nine um, primary missions, and um, and people that have have gone through it uh, have found it to be really valuable to them. Um, it's uh, it's it's very much focused on filling that bucket, helping you uh, your faith get stronger, uh, helping you see things in new ways, and. Um, uh, and then that's just going to naturally play out uh, in, in different ways in your lives and in the lives of others. All right. And so, um, so I want to challenge you to commit to start one thing this week. Like, what's, what's one thing? It's, it could be, you know, I'm going to go get this book. I'm going to re, uh, go read this blog. I'm going to, you know, this is one person that I'm going to focus on or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but I encourage you to pray about it and say, all right, God, what's the, what's the one thing that is a good place to start? And, um, you know, look at some of these ideas and, and just take to God. And, um, yeah, and the Lord's Prayer is a great way to, to start with them. All right. Any other questions? We're over time again. But <laughs> I'd like to share something. Yeah, by all means. Um, my high school girlfriend, we had a funeral for her on Saturday. Um, I, she was my girlfriend through high school. 
And um, she worked as my wife uh, at a clinic. And my wife passed away uh, April 8th of 2017. And soon after that, I went over with one of my wife's obituaries here and shared with her because she had worked with her and I thought she'd be interested. So I um, began talking. Uh, she said, well, I'm going to cut my grass. And I said, I'll stay and help. It turned out she really couldn't cut her grass. She's got slopes on two sides. It's, and it, it's right on the west side here. Anyway, I cut the grass for her then the rest of the summer of 2017. And then during that time, um, I like our bulletins because they've got Old Testament, New Testament, and Gospel in there. And I was dropping that off to her every week. In fact, she had, has an apartment in her house, and Linda that used the apartment wanted it also. So I was dropping two copies off to them, and then a neighbor around the corner was helping Nancy, and I was helping her, so I exchanged phone numbers and that, and I said, if you need something, give me a call if I can be of some help. And I'd give her one, and I'm still dropping one off to her every week. And I just feel that's a good way. Uh, I don't believe, I'm not even sure either of them went to church, but at least they're receiving the word every week. Um, in fact, at the funeral, they even had a picture of she and I on prom night. Oh my <laughs> gosh. You're a handsome devil there, She's very beautiful, too. Like a picture in the frame. She was, um, I guess, quite active with golf, and she had won several championships here, um, on the west side especially, in golfing. But what happened then was she was developing dementia. And I know that because that's what my wife did. She developed dementia and Alzheimer's, and that's what finally took her. But um, because she wasn't doing well with this dementia, she was falling and she was having trouble with meals at home in her home here. And her sister lives in Fergus Falls, which is over by the Dakota's border. And so she took her over there, what would have been in July of... 18. And so I really didn't get to talk with her beyond that time. But um, I did stay in contact with the sister, and they would come and work in the house and things, and so I would visit with them at times. Um, but like I say, she, oh, I got a call, what, last Sunday night, and they said that Nancy was refusing to eat, and that she was on hospice care, and then I got a call Monday that she had passed and some detail about the funeral, which was uh, Saturday. And of course, it's on Humboldt Avenue where the uh, funeral was. And Nancy and I both went to Humboldt. And so a lot of the ones that I was in school with in those years, graduated in 52, remembered me or I remembered them. <laughs> so it was kind of a gathering of that. Now I took pictures and shared them with her sister um, of Nancy in the casket and the people that were there and, and just some general pictures which I thought she would like to hear. So that was my that week. <laughs> yeah, and but I mean, what this is, you, you bring up another good point that you know you're, here you're you're bringing this bullet and, and then other people are asking for it and stuff like that. Yeah. I've seen this happen so many times where, you know, maybe there's, there's this person that, that I'm trying to connect with and stuff, and, and sometimes it's going well, sometimes not so well, and then, like, all of a sudden something out of the blue comes along. All of a sudden God goes, all right, be faithful, all right, keep going, and then all of a sudden he'll go, okay, now here, but here's actually the person that that I'm going to use you to, you know, to connect with and stuff. And it was like, it doesn't mean that that I was wasting my time there, all right? But it, you know, 
God has much bigger plans than we do. And uh, so many times that I've just gone, I, none of this makes sense, I don't get it, you know, I'm like, okay, well, I'm just gonna keep on going. And then all of a sudden, God just drops something in your lap. And um, it's just, it's, it's just, it's, it just blows me away every time that he does it. Speaking of that, um, this was last winter, I think, and the one that was helping her, um, I stopped by and she was shoveling snow. And I got the shovel out of my car and I was helping her shovel snow. And she just jammed the shovel into the pile of snow we were doing, made a flat place and sat down and asked me if I would pray with her. Mm -hmm. And then I go roller skating on Wednesday. I'm not able to do it much now. My knees are hurting, but I, I generally go. I can just go and visit. I don't have to skate. But a person I didn't know at all, I sat in the booth, and they were sitting in the booth, and she leaned over and asked me to pray with her. Now, mm -hmm. why not set that up? I don't know. Right. Yeah. And in each case, I did pray with them over the matter that they were concerned about. Mm -hmm. Now, at the roller rink, they may feel that I can be approached because I bring cookies every time. And I have shared with them that I get the cookies at church, that they get them from Cub, and I just am happy to bring them and share them with everybody. And that may be why they thought they could approach me. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's... But you've shown them the love of Christ, yeah. you know, through cookies. <laughs> And, uh, but I don't go around saying, hey, I want to tell you about the gospel. Oh, right, right. No, they Which, come to me. Yep, yep, yep. And oftentimes that'll happen. Yeah. Oh, and then another thing too. The skating rink, um, they know pretty much that my wife is gone that I'm by myself because I used to bring her skating. And at Christmas time this year, one of the gals from the roller rink uh, said, why don't you come over? We're, we'll be having dinner at, on Christmas Day. And I thought it was she wanted to just join with her family because she knew I was by myself. It turned out that she invited 10 or 12 people from the skating rink and it was a party for people from the skating rink. Well, then I got invited the same way at Easter. Hmm. And at the Christmas one, um, people shared some of the things that they were experiencing during the Christmas time around the table. Several, you know, and then she even read some things, some, <laughs> I don't know what you'd call them, but it, it was a, a real uh, sharing of Christian things around that table, both times. Same. Right. Um, one last thing. There's some papers here um, because I hope to do more along this line. Um, I invite you to grab one of those and uh, fill it out. You don't have to write your name or anything on it, but uh, this will just help me to know, you know, how, um, you know, the, the what's effective, what's not, you know, uh, things like that. So. Or did you do that while I... Can I ask you a quick question? So yep. you've been recording these. Is there a way we can tap in if you want to review a session? Or? Yep. It's all, if you go to the um, to the St. James website, okay. sermons, you go to series, okay. natural outreach, and they're all right there. Okay.